Hello everybody, this is Lisa Johnson from Everbridge. Welcome to today's webinar, Emergency Response Best Practices with Regina Phelps. We're going to go over our agenda today, a few logistics and introductions, um, and then Regina will take over and discuss the types of emergencies, including routine, crisis, and emergent. She'll talk about creating teams, such as an initial assessment team and a facility management team. She'll talk about her incident action plan and how to write one, how communication sets the tone for emergency response, and how you can use templates to speed response times. After that, we'll open it up for questions, um, so definitely give us your questions throughout the entire webinar. You can follow us on Twitter, at EB Healthcare. We have a very active Twitter account that's focused on emergency management. And I'd like to introduce Regina now. Regina Phelps is an internationally recognized expert in the field of emergency management and continuity planning. Since 1982, she has provided consultation and speaking services to clients in four continents. She is a founder of Emergency Management and Safety Solutions, a consulting company specializing in emergency management, continuity, continuity planning, and safety. Ms. Phelps conducts over 100 exercises per year for her large multinational clients. She has lectured extensively at international disaster and business continuity conferences. And last year, she authored a textbook on exercise design entitled From Response to Recovery, Conducting Successful Exercises. She has also designed college-level courses in exercise design. Welcome, Regina. Great, Lisa. Thank you so much. It's a real pleasure for me to be with all of you today. All right. Well, so first of all, thanks very much. It's a real pleasure to be here today to talk about what I believe is an critically important issue, and that is the issue of um, emergency response and best practices. And what I want to do is I want to talk about, first of all, as Lisa said, I'm going to cover about the issues related to routine crisis and emergent crises and sort of talk about some definitions so that we're all on the same page. And then I want to talk about what I think are the three essentials, the team structure, the incident assessment process, and also how to develop an action plan. We're talking a little bit about effective and timely communications, and then we'll wipe up uh, by talking about successful emergency response. So first of all, let's take a moment and actually look at this issue related to um, the three types of emergencies. And let, let me first of all say that I, these are not my definitions I'm going to be talking about. I had the privilege of going to the Harvard Crisis Management Program several years ago, and the professors there have uh, three definitions that I think are really helpful for all of us in the field to actually uh, sort of galvanize around, if you will, because it gives us a way to clearly understand what we're talking about. So let me first of all talk with uh, you about what I call a routine emergency. Now, by routine, that first of all does not mean that it's easy. But what it means essentially is it is somewhat predictable. It's in your risk profile. So if you look at your, your hospital or your um, healthcare organization's risk profile, what you'll see is it will list all the things that are likely to happen to you based on your location, the type of building, and so on. And so these are routine emergencies. We expect them, and that means that we can actually take advantage of previous lessons from prior experience, and we can also plan for them. We can actually have plans that address them. We can have training that addresses them, and we can design exercises that build our team's strength. That's what all of us on this call do for a living. We plan for routine emergencies. Now, one of the things that we don't plan for is we don't plan for a crisis emergency. Now, let me uh, say why that's different from a routine emergency. First of all, this is really distinguished by one significant element, and that is novelty. First of all, threats that have never happened before. So for example, if you go back to the 9-11 crisis when two planes hit the Trade Center, that has never happened before. And I'll tell you, if I would have told one of my clients in the Trade Center, I want to design an exercise for you about two planes hitting the Trade Center, they would have kicked me out of the building. It had never happened before. People couldn't imagine it. The second is something happening with uh, very, it's a familiar event, but it's happening at unprecedented speed. Think, for example, of Hurricane Katrina. Hurricanes, of course, uh, that was well in the risk profile of New Orleans. And they also had uh, levee breaks in their risk profile. They had never expected those two familiar events to happen at such speed and at the same time. 
The third example of this novelty idea is really when you have a confluence of forces, maybe they're not new, but they pose unique challenges. So for example, think about Hurricane, um, 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 I just slipped, it slipped my mind. Sandy. I said, what starts with an S? Hurricane Sandy. When you think of Hurricane Sandy, that's a great example of a uh, not a new event, but many different things happening at the same time. Look at the impact of healthcare in New York alone. So here we had a situation that was happening with incredible uh, timing. It happened all at once, and it was the largest storm that had ever happened in the United States, 1,100 miles of storm um, coverage and huge widespread power outages. Most of our clients in the East Coast had no ability to activate their continuity plans because their continuity plans had never imagined something so unique. So because of this novelty, our plans don't work. And we pull them out and we look at them and they're either really inadequate or they might even be counterproductive. Now, one of the things I would like you to think about how you describe yourself in your job as far as emergencies are concerned, and if you ever say to somebody, I plan for the worst case scenario, I invite you, I beg you to take that out of your vocabulary because you don't. There's not enough money, time, energy in the world for us to plan for the worst case scenario. And that really is this example of a crisis emergency. What we plan for as emergency managers, business continuity professionals, emergency response individuals, is we plan for a routine emergency. Now why this crisis requires different capabilities, first of all you have to actually diagnose what's going on, what's novel about this, and actually as an emergency manager, an emergency response person, this is one of the first things you have to do. You have to ask yourself, what's different about this emergency? Because if you keep thinking that you know what it is, I know what this hurricane looks like, I know all about earthquakes, I know about fires, then you don't actually see when things are actually different. So always question what's going on when you see an event in front of you. Is this really what I think it is? Then what happens is that once you realize, oh my gosh, this is really different, then we have to improvise. And when we improvise, now we have to actually create something that didn't exist before. So we actually have to, because of this uh, situation, we have to look at things very differently. And this requires a creative and a very adaptable approach for new solutions. The old solutions won't work. There's one other kind of event that I think is a really good one to talk about, especially related to healthcare, and that's an emergent crisis. An emergent crisis is very challenging because you kind of think you know what it is initially because it looks like a routine emergency. And in the early stages you go, yes, I know what this looks like. But then as the situation evolves, it begins to change. And there's two great examples of this. One is our disease outbreaks, especially in hospitals. And the second is actually a cyber crisis or a cyber breach because the technologists might think they know what's going on and they don't see that things are actually different. The problem with an emergent crisis is people become wed, if you will, to their response, to their original solution, and therefore they're very slow to adapt when they realize, oh my gosh, this is different. So to give you an idea of what that looks like diagrammatically, the blue line at the bottom showing kind of like, you know, our normal uh, routine, routine operations, the purple line at the top, that's certainly the sudden crisis or the crisis emergency. It starts awful and oh my gosh, it only gets worse. The routine emergency, you'll notice that's that green line. And what happens is that once we actually get our arms around it, we get our plans moving, we get our staff activated, because remember they're trained, you've had exercises, you have plans to respond. It starts off like any emergency, but then you get your arms around it and you can manage it. So that gives us a huge advantage. The emergent crisis, you kind of think that you've got your arms around it and you're actually managing it, but in reality, um, as you can see from that line as it begins to then go north, if you will, that really it begins to continue to degrade over time. Probably one of the greatest examples of this is actually SARS. And for many of us in the healthcare field, I originally, my background's in nursing and I was a hospital administrator uh, many years ago. Uh, I followed this very closely. I found it so fascinating. So just to remind you to talk about this, because this is a great example of an emergent crisis. So this is a crisis emergency of its highest level. 
The index case of the SARS event was a woman actually who came um, to Toronto. She returned from Toronto from Hong Kong. And this was going back in February 23 of 2003. She started developing symptoms uh, which were very flu-like. And then on March 5th she died uh, with not being recognized that she actually had SARS. So she was the index case. One woman brought this disease to Toronto. Interestingly enough, <clears throat> it actually had a major impact in healthcare in the Toronto region. So the outbreak occurred literally between March and didn't actually finish till July because there were actually two waves. It started in March and then it actually ended the first wave at the end of April and then it started again in May and then uh, concluded in July. So SARS number one, their first case, was thought to be over in early uh, May, but then it reemerged again because, again, they were not able to, con uh, to contain people adequately. And it was the only significant uh, infection outside of Asia. Who actually issued a travel advisory for the Toronto region on April 23rd? They lifted it about a week later, but Toronto lost, they estimate, about $350 million uh, in loss and then a $380 million retail loss based on previous years simply because of this um, outbreak and tremendous fear. Four people died uh, from the outbreak and 400 became ill and there were 25,000 people placed into quarantine. Two hospitals had their emergency departments shut down and one hospital was shut down completely and that was the index hospital who actually had the woman who died. There's a great timeline and if you're interested in studying this one in particular it's a great story about how this particular disease actually originated and the impact it had to the healthcare system. And you could just imagine in your facility, whether it's a clinic or a hospital, inpatient or outpatient, this could happen to you. Uh, and I think about that often with the outbreak of diseases that we see. And you'll see on the slide in front of you, and you'll, you can certainly get these slides from Lisa, you can actually go to these sites and really take a look and peel this back, but you can actually see very easily how it started in Asia and went over to, to, um, to Canada and then quickly melted down, seriously impacting two hospitals, closing one completely and one other's emergency department. So it's a great example of an emergent crisis. Now when you stop and think about emergencies, what you want to think about is first of all how you manage them and for you to be able to manage them effectively, it requires three things. What we believe are the three most essential aspects uh, for emergency response. The first thing is that your team must have its roles and responsibilities. You must clearly know what you're supposed to do uh, and they must be trained in advance to do that. The second is there must be a very clear assessment process, an assessment team, and some sort of escalation strategy figured out in advance. And then thirdly, you have to develop what's called an incident action plan. And if you're a, a follower of ICS, this is of course one of the hallmarks of ICS. So let's take a moment and peel back all three of these particular areas. So first of all, let's take a look at team structure, both in roles and in responsibilities. I want to start first of all by talking about the incident command system. And those of you within the healthcare field, of course, are very familiar with this because you very likely are using HICS, the Hospital Incident Command System. Um, ICS came out of my state. I live in San Francisco, so in, Cal in Southern California in the early 70s, there were a series of wildfires that went very poorly. Uh, and the ICS model actually was developed during that time. It's now used extensively uh, in public and private sectors all over the United States, uh, and it's actually required by law. I've actually taught ICS in four continents and in 23 countries. Uh, it's widely accepted as the methodology to use for managing emergencies. Uh, and since 2005, it's required by all federal, state, county, and city agencies, so any emergency responder that comes to you is using ICS, and of course hospitals utilize it through the incident command system. So I'm assuming that many of you have some familiarity with it, and I'm going to talk just a little bit about it to make sure that we're all on the same page. The six C's of what I call crisis management emergency response is really what you get by utilizing the incident command system. The first of all is command and control. What you're looking for whenever you have any kind of incident is you need command and control. Who's in charge? How are we able to manage the incident? And how are we uh, managing effectively? 
We also want to be able to collaborate, and this is really important, especially in a large organization like such as a hospital. How all different departments and groups, physicians, staff, volunteers can all work together collaboratively in order to manage the event, which requires the next one, which is a tremendous amount of coordination. How do we coordinate our efforts to make sure that we are not duplicating and that things aren't being missed? Communication is essential, and that's one of the great hallmarks of ICS is that we're able to actually find a very effective tool and, and method for communication. And then lastly, we have a consistent response, and that's critically important uh, so that we, again, can respond effectively, but with consistency and people know what to expect from us. The traditional ICS model, of course, looks like this. There's essentially the command position, which, at, at which has the uh, incident commander. Uh, and then there's a communications group off to the side there. And then you'll see that there are four boxes below. Operations, which is primarily the tactical field response. Logistics, which is both HR and the procurement of things. Planning intelligence, which is where your key lines of business and also things such as legal and regulatory might be. And then lastly, finance, which is where your uh, accounting, uh, and your financial folks are insurance, risk, those kinds of folks. Uh, I'm assuming that many of you have this type of model uh, and are familiar with it. And very likely, if you're a facilities person, you're very more than likely probably either in the operations or possibly in the logistics box of your hospital or healthcare systems ICS model. What's really important is that you find out what your, your role is within the organization and make sure that your entire facilities team clearly understands the HICS model and how you actively engage and participate in any activation. Certainly the thing about facilities folks is that many times the emergency can start based on a facilities type outage or event. So whether it's a fire or possibly something related to a power outage, uh, something related to um, an emergency response such, such as something post earthquake, there's lots of issues where facilities are front and center. If you're not in a facility that uses the Hicks model, I would really encourage that you consider using it. And there's a lot of places to go for information about that. So what I would ask all of you to do, uh, first of all, is to know what your overall healthcare facility plan is. And then understanding that your team on the facility side clearly understands what their role and responsibility as dictated by your plan um, requires. And if you want additional information about ICS, there's actually a healthcare organization uh, training out of FEMA, which is in the FEMA Independent Study Learning. It's IS200 HCA. This is a free program. If you've never gone to the FEMA IS site, I would really encourage you to Google that. They have probably over 100 trainings. They're all free. And you can actually get certificates in all of those. And there's a variety of them that would be very applicable to healthcare and specifically facilities. And I would encourage you to look at that. The next key thing, of course, is that you want to make sure that your teams are actually practicing. And so participating in whatever exercises that you organize for your individual department or how you organize within the actual healthcare system itself. Uh, exercises is one way that we build proficiency. It's one thing to write a plan. Uh, but you write it in a vacuum. The only way you know any of it ever works is by actually practicing it. Which then gets us to look at your actual plan itself. In your plan, if I was to audit your documentation, what I would want to see minimally is a very clear list of who are the team roles in your facilities department, what do you expect them to do at the time of crisis, and make sure there's a very clear checklist for each one of those positions. Now, you may say, well, that seems like a waste of time and everybody knows their job. Well, that might be true. But let me say to you that in any crisis, people don't always respond. They may not be able to come in post-earthquake or post-event. They might be injured. They might be hurt. They might have family members that are injured or hurt and not able to respond. So you might be having somebody doing a task on your group who isn't been trained, and they may not even be a facilities person. So checklists are really for those individuals to f use them to make sure that you've done everything, to train people on the fly if they don't know what to do, and then also to be able to make sure that we've covered all the key bases. 
And you want to make sure that your plan and your checklist fit your risk profile. So take out your hazard risk analysis for your facility. Look down that hazard risk analysis and make sure that you have covered the major issues. So an earthquake or hurricane related event is so much different than a fire or a bomb threat at your location. And the major reason you want to be looking to make sure that you've identified regional risks is regional risks are those things that no one else is going to be coming to help you immediately and you're really on your own. So look at your risk profile, make sure that your plan and your checklist are designed to fit the routine emergency in that risk profile. Let's talk a little bit about incident assessment process. So this is my number two on the things that I think that you need to do. The reason I think this is so important is I find that when I audit, our company audits a lot of plans. Um, we're hired by companies to come in and take a look at what their plans look like and to help them improve them. One of the things I often find when I look at a plan is that they have, maybe they have great checklists and maybe they have a good structure and maybe they even know how to do an action plan. But it's not clearly documented and oftentimes not documented at all about how any problem gets assessed who assesses it, who has the authority to activate the plan, and what kind of criteria do they use. Uh, and it seems like when I read those plans, all of a sudden we go from everything is fine to, oh my gosh, the plan is activated, but it doesn't say how we got there. And that's what this process talks about. So first of all, we believe that there should be an incident assessment team at every organization. And this incident assessment team has a really important job. And their job is to, first of all, uh, conduct this assessment about this incident that we're faced with. Some things are blatantly obvious that you're going to activate, others not so much. So first of all, who should be on that team? And I'll tell you, if this is a facility-wide incident assessment team, which very likely it would be, of course think about where emergencies come from. And I'll tell you that there are three people that are always on an incident assessment team. Facilities, number one, because so many events are facility-based. Number two would be security, if security is independent from your group, uh, because many issues might have to deal with a security problem. Number three, technology, because we have lots of technology issues, and increasingly in healthcare with computerized records, this is even more of a, a, a significant concern. And then there might be several other people you might add. You might have HR, uh, maybe somebody from administration. Um, that's probably it. Maybe you only need about four or five people. And most of our clients, there's probably about between five and seven people on their assessment team. Now what do they do? Uh, their job is to conduct the initial assessment. And what they're going to do is they're going to review some criteria and escalations to see if indeed um, this, they should, the plan should be activated. And their task is to actually make that determination. Do we activate the plan or not? And please note when you look at that slide, uh, we also believe that any member should be able to activate the plan. And this is not like if you have seven people on the, on the call that it's you know, a vote of five out of seven, let's say, or that um, everybody has to show up, or they have to be the administrator to make the decision. No, we believe that if the team believes that the plan needs to be activated, anybody can do it. And think about that, especially um, in a crisis uh, where communication might be really hampered and you're not able to reach people by phone, and so you want to make sure that you can activate the plan if you need to. Don't, don't encumber people. The third thing, part of the assessment process is we should clearly talk about how they're going to communicate. Uh, most of our clients would be utilizing an emergency notification system because they could immediately send out a message to all the team members and tell them to immediately jump on a bridge, a conference bridge, and often that's associated with that emergency notification system. So they get on the bridge and then they discuss the problem. We also suggest strongly that you clearly identify where people would meet physically if that was a possibility. And that you should only have uh, not only one place that they would meet, but I would actually suggest, to be honest, three. One is where you'd meet inside the building, which might be at the front entrance or somebody's office or a conference room or something like that. The second would be where would you meet outside, assuming that the building might have been evacuated or there was some emergent issue that required people to get out of the building. And the third is maybe some distance away looking at your risk profile. So maybe it's several blocks away. Uh, and again, the reason you would have these three places picked out in advance is that communication might be difficult. 
and you don't want people to say, well, gosh, where do we meet? Because you've never thought about it before. So using an emergency notification system, if you have one to notify people, or using some sort of group text function, then you want to make sure that you have um, a bridge designated for them that they can go to immediately. And then you want to have three physical meeting places, one inside the building, one immediately outside the building, and then one a possible distance away, several blocks or maybe more, depending on what your risk profile is. That should all be part of this initial document. So when I look at your assessment uh, document, I want to see who's on the team. I want to see clear, clearly see what your responsibilities you've given them, and I want to see the communication strategies you've worked out. Then what we do is our team gets together. Great. Okay, super. Now what do we do? So the first thing the initial assessment team does is they have to gather what's called situational awareness. This is really important because this is what they're going to be using to make the decision. Where does this information come from? It could be from visually from somebody who's actually standing there seeing the situation. It could be news broadcast. They could be hearing it from other employees. But gathering situational awareness, what do you know? And then as part of that conversation, you want to begin to discuss, well, what's impacted? So what do we know and what's impacted? Uh, is it just our facility? Is it other facilities? Do we have employees, visitors, patients who are injured? Um, do we have any impact to the business? Can we still do our job? Can we still do our healthcare related position? Um, is there impacts to our reputation of the organization? And what's the overall effect of this incident? So when we're having our situational awareness, we're all contributing what we know about the event, and then what we're doing is we're then sitting back and looking at our what's impacted, what's the effects of this incident. And then what we want to do is we're also going to peel this back just a little tiny bit farther when we talk about the type of event, because there could be several. Uh, is it a local event? I mean, and really just a small area, so really just you. Uh, so think about, um, is it just a power outage in your area? Is it a fire? Is it some sort of flooding? Uh, and by flooding, I mean maybe it's a, bit a pipe breakage. So it's just a very small area. Or is it a regional event, uh, so a massive flooding or earthquakes or hurricanes? Uh, and the reason that's important is that it really tells you right away that you're going to be on your own for a much longer period of time. Is it a national event like 9-11? Now, of course, when 9-11 occurred, there were only three places in the United States where there was a physical impact. Washington, D.C., New York, and outside of uh, Philadelphia and Pennsylvania. But yet the entire country activated their plans. And so it's not just a obvious event to you. Uh, an international event may not be so applicable for you, but we do a lot of work abroad. And I will tell you, we've actually had clients of ours who have activated plans because they had executives or key individuals who might have been in a, in a situation. Like we had people that lost um, clients who lost folks in the Madrid bombing, uh, train bombing. We had people that were involved in the Mumbai um, hotel uh, uh, invasion. Uh, uh, so you have situations where it can be um, uh, really problematic. And then what about some terrorism related event that could be a threat or actual real event? So we also want to get a frame about what this event looks like. Now when your team comes together, they basically are going to talk really about just five things. At least this is our belief. And maybe perhaps once I explain these, you think, well, no, I'd have to add a few more. But I'll tell you, we used to have very long and complicated uh, criteria uh, for activation. And we realized that, no, you, there's really only five things that people really have to talk about. The first one is people, and you always start with people first. Are lives at danger? Is there some sort of life safety issue? Or is there an impact to your patients, your employees, your visitors, your vendors? Um, is there um, lives at risk? Are there people injured? Are there deaths? Um, so a good discussion about the people-related issues is very important and critical and always the first thing you talk about. The second thing you want to talk about is facilities and critical infrastructure and really talking about you know, what's happening in our facility? Are we able to still function or, or operate? Can we move to some other part of the building? Do we have to go out onto the street? You want to really have a good discussion about the facility itself, and that's the walls, if you will, but also the infrastructure, which is utilities and water and sewer and all those things. You need to have a good understanding of that for you to make a decision about how your team would move forward. Technology, is there any disruption in your technology services? So that's telecommunications, that your, that's your overall network, which is increasingly critical. Your data center, servers, all of that. Is there an information security 
a serious security issue. Maybe this is like a breach. Um, so, and increasingly, as uh, healthcare has become much more technologically focused, this is even a more critical issue than it ever was before. The fourth thing, uh, are you able to perform your mission critical business functions? So if you're a clinic, uh, that's for you would be seeing patients. It might be doing outpatient surgeries. If you're an inpatient facility, my gosh, you have a host of things that you do that are mission critical, from uh, x-rays and lab to pharmacy to ICUs and operating rooms and labor and delivery and everything else. So can you perform your, perform your mission critical functions? Uh, does this event impact patients and um, and also there's some question about does this have a big financial impact so that could be some part of your discussion as well. And then lastly uh, is one that is subjective. So the first four that I mentioned are very tangible and you can see these are black and white but the last one not so much but it's critically important. Will this event uh, impact your company or your facility's reputation or brand? You may say well why is that important? Well my gosh especially in healthcare People need to trust you, and they need to believe that you are a credible uh, provider of a service that are, that's that's life-giving and life-taking, right? So it's critically important that you have a discussion related to that because you might do more uh, to manage this event uh, than even you might otherwise because of this reputation and brand issue, and you might activate solely because of that reputation and brand issue. So we often we we call this kind of the activation bingo card, but you can kind of see that we're really talking about four things, five things, excuse me, people, facilities, technology, mission critical activities, reputation and brand, and then the axis that goes down the far left, that's really the location of this event. So is it just you? If you have other locations, are they affected as well? Is it a regional event, a national event, or an international event, as I mentioned earlier? So that's all the background before we even actually um, get any farther along. Now, there's a little bit more your team's going to need to discuss before they call the question. Uh, what's the severity level? So let me just talk a little bit about this. And I don't know if your healthcare facility um, utilizes a severity level, but it's very common in our industry and in, um, in the public sector and or in private sector in particular is to utilize a severity index. So if you imagine uh, the example I would give you is uh, is yellow, uh, green, yellow, red. So if you imagine that we have a level one, which would be green, level two, which would be yellow, and level three, which would be red. A level one might be a relatively minor incident. Your team's never going to get together for a minor incident. This happen every day because you firefight as a facilities person every single day of your life. Um, so very likely your initial assessment team would never get together. But you might, they might be notified depending on the kind of event that it might be. A level two is a yellow event as we call it and it has a moderate impact. So maybe you have a fire in a part of your building and part of the building is unavailable but the rest of it is functional. Or you've got a situation where you've got uh, a minor earthquake and it's done some damage but the building is functional. So you have a business impact but you're able to really to work around it. And the red one is a level three, that would be the catastrophic earthquake, the catastrophic fire. Uh, the assessment team uh, talks for three seconds on the call to make an activation, but they still actually do that because what they do next is critically important. So some idea that you could actually um, go through and literally um, just quickly, is this a one, two, or a three? It's kind of like a little shorthand. It helps people wrap their brain around the situation. So once we have gone through and talked about all of those things, then we actually call the question, does this incident meet our activation criteria? And if the answer is yes, we're going to activate our crisis management plan, our emergency response plan, we're going to activate the emergency operations center uh, in your facility, and you're going to inform your uh, executives immediately. Uh, you're also going to make some decisions about where you would activate uh, based on the scenario, and you might initially activate virtually on a conference bridge because of what's going on, and it's going to take a while for people to assemble or to actually get started. If the answer is no at the end of this whole process that you've got on a call or you've met face-to-face, -face, then I would say to you is that you should still monitor the situation. If it was ever bad enough for you to get on a call, then you need to actually make sure that you have actually uh, followed this situation up because uh, it could continue to get problematic. It's kind of like the smoldering couch or something, right? You think of it initially as not being a problem and we've got our arms around it, but if nobody's watching it, it could get out of control and then all of a sudden it will explode, if you will, and that's a problem.
So who on the initial assessment team is in charge of monitoring the event? Uh, when would you inform people about the status of the event? And how would you do that? Those are all decisions we want to make in advance. And then we want to, um, then uh, once the situation is resolved, we go back to standard business practices. So pretty straightforward. The assessment process, really important, and I would ask all of you to look at your plans. Do you have an assessment team? Do you have criteria that you would message? Who has responsibility and authority to activate? What do you do when you activate, and then how do you monitor? All those things should be decided right now and in your plan very quickly and efficiently. That gets us down to once we've decided to activate, we need to develop what's called an incident action plan. And if you use HICS, you're probably familiar with this, but I want to talk about this just for a moment because it's so important. Now, an incident action plan is actually a hallmark of ICS, and if you stop and think about it, it's extremely logical. It makes perfect sense. But yet, many people don't do this formally. So they meet, they think, oh, okay, we're going to activate, okay, let's go, everybody get out your plans, but there's no plan of who is doing what. And what an action plan is, is it simply documents that. It's really important because it allows people then to be able to communicate and to effectively manage an event, and we can coordinate much more effectively. So let's talk about what's in this magical little document called an IAP. First of all, when you look at an IAP, it's got essentially about four little sections to it. And, and, and there, are, there are ICS forms for this, but most of our clients, I'll be honest, don't use any ICS forms. They use a basic Word document that has these four areas noted. The first one is what's the overall incident or status. And of course, that's the situational awareness that we just talked about when we talked about the initial assessment team. Uh, those individuals know what's going on, and then of course, Subsequently, after that, we're going to have another way. Have to find other ways to pull in situational awareness. And let me just speak for just a moment about that. You may think that that's pretty easy to do, and I'll be, I'll tell you, it's actually not. To find out what's going on and actually be able to take all of that information about what's happening, and first of all, organize it in a way that people can digest it and then make decisions on it is not an easy task, and it's one that you should think about when you do an exercise. So who provides the situational awareness. How do you pull all that information into your command center? How do you validate it? Uh, and let me say that you'll be getting information from lots of sources, uh, things that you personally witness or see, things that other people on the team see. There might be phone calls that come in. They might be speaking to emergency responders. They might be dealing with um, police or fire. They might also be hearing things on the media traditional media like radio or television, but increasingly there'll be Twitter and Facebook, all these social media postings, and those are ways of getting information. But you have to, of course, validate those things. So how do you get the status all pulled together in a way that makes sense is a very important activity and exercise for you to think about. So in the IAP, you'll have a, probably a paragraph or two about the overall incident and the situational awareness. Then what you're going to do is you're going to write very specific objectives about what is going to be done. And I'll talk more about that in just a moment. And then every one of those objectives should be clearly assigned to a team or an individual. So if I want to know who's responsible for uh, assessing the, uh, the, the facility, there'd be a name or a team name right next to it. Or maybe I want to make sure that somebody has done an, an initial damage assessment. Who's responsible for that? Or perhaps I want to make sure that I want to know who's going to account for all employees. So who, there should be a name or a team name there. And then lastly, how long do you work on this uh, plan before you come back together and report out status? That's called an operational period. At the beginning of any incident, the operational period might be short, and then over time, it gets longer. So these IAPs need to be written. Uh, because, first of all, it allows for a lot less conf confusion or duplication of effort, and certainly it helps eliminate miscommunication. And you can also share this widely so that people know what your team is working on. Uh, and it's something that you can send out by email or send to executives or send to whomever so that everybody knows what you're working on. 
So when you look at this overall uh, plan, essentially, as I mentioned, it's got several parts. So, so I've already talked about the situational awareness, but I do want to emphasize this again. Think about where do you get the information? How do you bring it into the command center? How do you display it so people can make decisions? How do you validate it so that you know that it's right? So that's critically important. Then the strategic objectives, and let me just talk about, about that just for a little bit more. This is really what I would call a to-do list. It's a very specific to-do list though, and notice the way I've talked about them. Uh, they're very short, clear objectives, short sentences, and every one of those sentences or to-do list items starts with an action-oriented verb. Why am I so picky about that? Because the first word is going to tell people exactly what they're expected to do. So if I tell you your job is to activate our business continuity plans, it's really clear what I've asked you to do. Or if I said your job is to assess uh, the impact of the facility, that's very clear. Or if your job is to account for all employees, very clear as well. Sometimes people write objectives and somewhere in that sentence is buried the actual verb and people still can't find it or know what to do with it. So when we ask people to write objectives, they're really clear, they're really short, and every first word of every objective is an action-oriented verb. Then we assign every one of those. So think of that as a to-do list. That's the to-do list for this period of time, the operational period. We assign every single objective so that we know exactly who's working on what, really important. And then we always then determine the operational period. At the beginning of any incident, the operational period is often quite short, maybe a couple hours, maybe three hours. And then over time, the operational period gets longer, could even be eight or 12 hours. Uh, that does not mean if some big crisis happens in the middle of the operational period, you have to wait till the operational period is over to report that out. Uh, but it simply means that this is what our planning cycle is. And then lastly, we have the ability now to communicate because we can communicate this plan to every identified key stakeholder. And that's really important because that's going to help us as far as um, making sure that everybody knows what everybody's doing. Which then ties to my last comment. So I've talked about the three major issues, the roles and responsibilities and clear team identification, the incident assessment process, who's on the team and what criteria do you use. The third key thing of the three essentials is how you develop an action plan. But then the next piece that's really important is timely and effective communication. And this is increasingly a, a critical issue, and especially because of social media in particular, uh, which drives so many responses in this day and age. And I want to just say that effective and timely communications don't just happen. There's, there's no magic here. This takes planning, and it takes work, and you need to have the right tools. So when you look at communication, you want to make sure that we have thought this out. And it's probably not just you that's doing that. It's working very closely with other people that are in part of a larger team and certainly the crisis communications team. But on the facility side, there's a lot that you're going to likely need to communicate and you might be empowered to communicate those things immediately. And let me give you an example. In our organization, what we do is we write lots of crisis communications plans. And one of the things that we have done very clearly is when we write one is that we divide communications into three buckets. There's emergency communications, there is tactical communications, and there is strategic communications. So three buckets, emergency, tactical, strategic. Why is that important? Because this is my belief about communication. Sometimes communications is held up because people uh, need to get messages approved by someone or uh, they need to have some uh, process followed, which then slows down communications. So if you divide them into emergency, tactical, and strategic, what we've done in our crisis communications plan has said very clearly who has the right to write approve and release each one of those messages. Our belief is that in emergency communications, there's probably only two individuals or two departments within any organization that has the authority to deal with those. And that's generally facilities and security. Because emergency response is as, as the name implies, emergency, life saving. 
So whether that's fire, earthquake, workplace violence, bombs, whatever, those things must be done in advance. They must be pre-approved by whoever needs them, and the emergency response messages should be able to be sent out with no approval at the time because you don't have time to have a meeting to get things approved. Tactical communications are more things such as instructions to employees or instructions to patients or visitors. Many of those can be pre-written and pre-approved and require very little um, uh, additional modification or approval uh, once the incident occurs. The last ones are strategic, which are much more about the mission, the brand, uh, and key stakeholders, and those are, again, managed very much by the communications team and also uh, very often uh, uh, authorized or signed off by the executives. But for a facilities-related event, you should have all those things pre-approved now. So you need this communication plan that has these authorities. And again, I would encourage you to think about three buckets. Because when you isolate those three buckets, it's much easier to get an executive to say, yes, indeed, the emergency response procedures, we don't need to uh, look at those before they go out. You shouldn't, that should never happen. There should be pre-written templates, and you want to make sure that you have the right tools. So let's peel all of that back. So um, when we talk about communications plans, as I've just mentioned, is that we want to make sure that you have really clearly identified who can write these communications. And maybe if you're a facilities manager, you don't write them, but maybe the communications department writes them because they're the wordsmithers, if you will. Uh, who can edit them? Uh, very likely that would be you. And who approves them? Ideally, an emergency response message, that should be a facilities person and or security. Um, so the reason we actually have these three little picky things is that I've just found out for 34 years of practice that you might have a, a, a communication that's written in a templated communication and it's all been approved, but then all of a sudden somebody comes along and thinks they have the right to edit it. Oh my gosh, picky wordsmithing is never good and often results in very untimely communications. So you want to make sure you actually address the editing thing because you'll be surprised who wants to wordsmith your document. And then lastly, who approves them. And then, as I mentioned earlier, these three levels of communication and many facilities issues, many security issues are going to be emergency comms. There should be no reason that they have to be approved by anybody at the time of crisis. They should all be already written, approved, and they just go out once you've modified them on the fly to meet the event. The tactical comms, as I mentioned earlier, which are much more instructive, and then the strategic ones, which are more in the um, area of what executives would be sending out through press releases and so on. So very important because we need to be able to effectively communicate rapidly in order to um, get this emergency handled. Which then gets to the tool issue, which is also extremely important. So we've got to have two things. We have to have template communications. Those are critical. Um, those should be all done now. And as I mentioned, they're in these three categories, the emergency, tactical, and the strategic. But pre-written templates, you should never, ever start with a white piece of paper at the time of crisis. If you go back to your risk profile, you know what to expect for the vast majority of crises, those things should all be pre-written and pre-approved and in those three areas I mentioned. Then we talk about the tools. How do you let people know what they need to do? Well, you've got options. Um, First of all, is a public address system. So if you need to send out a message rapidly, um, which could be a fire evacuation, it could even be for something like an active shooter, as long as you have power, a public address system, and, and you want everybody to hear it, a public address system is a great and effective immediate way to notify the largest number of people that are in that facility. That makes some assumptions, though. Uh, the first is that the public address system is, is heard everywhere. And if it's not, you need to know about where those areas are. Sometimes when we've actually, our firm has done high-rise uh, fire drills and high-rise uh, fire plants for years, and many times we'll walk a building during a drill, and you'll hear some places where you can hardly hear the alarm. You can never hear the public address. So if you have areas like that of your facility, you need to know where they are so that those people can be communicated to in other ways. Two-way radios. 
Many of our clients have gotten rid of a lot of their two-way radios simply because of cellular service. And boy, cell service uh, will immediately become unavailable in any crisis. That's because everybody picks up their phone and most cellular systems are only designed between 10 and 12 percent traffic at any time. And of course, everybody picking up a phone will fill a cell very rapidly and there'll be no cell service text, very likely, but certainly no phone calls. So two-way radios, if you still have those, gosh, they're really good. And uh, the good news is you can get to a lot of places in the building. Again, making sure that you've identified areas where there might be a problem and perhaps you need a repeater uh, installed to make sure that you have good coverage. And the last one that we recommend is certainly emergency notification systems. And the good thing about an ENS is that they can actually be effectively uh, deployed and they can reach many different uh, people in many different ways. So it can send, uh, of course, mobile phone calls, it can send text messages or SMS, it can be deployed to an office, a home, or a work or home email, or all of those things. The other good thing about an ENS, of course, is the fact that you actually have the ability then to uh, deploy the message and it will keep chasing somebody as long as you have instructed it to do so. So if you're trying to account for all your staff after some event, it can keep chasing people in all of the different ways you've asked um, until it finds them. And then, of course, you have, from, in most emergency notification systems, you have the ability to do some sort of polling. So you might say, uh, in an active shooter situation, you might send out a, uh, a notification and it says, you know, press one if you're in the building, or you've exited the building and you're safe. Press two if you're in the building. Press three if you're in the building and you're injured, or something like that. So it gives you the ability to even get more information. So emergency notification system is a very effective tool, uh, but it must, first of all, be... Um, trained and people must have really thought about the groups and how it's going to be deployed so it's um, usable and it can be uh, digestible and, and segmentable and the other thing is it's only as good as the information you have in it and I find, I find sometimes in our employees that um, uh, and our clients that people uh, and their employee population are reluctant to give personal data, like a personal cell phone or a personal home email. So sometimes you really have to do a sales job with your staff to talk about why it's so important that you can reach them at time of crisis. So if you find that you look at your um, listing in your emergency notification system and you see you have a large number of people that you don't have personal cell phones or you don't have home emails, think about how you can educate your staff about how important it is that you get a hold of them at time of emergency. That's what you want to be thinking about. So think about the data and what you have in it. So then when you stop and think about it, successful management of uh, any routine crisis or emergency uh, um, situation uh, requires several things. It requires really having clearly defined and documented team processes. Cannot emphasize that enough. Having clear roles and responsibilities. And this must be documented in some sort of checklist format so that anybody can assist you uh, if necessary. You need a really clearly defined initial assessment team and a process so that we all know how the plan gets activated, who is responsible, and what their task is. You need to clearly also understand how you actually develop an incident action plan. We need written communications, a plan, but we also need pre-written templates and effective delivery tools. And lastly, and critically important, you've got to have good regular training and you've got to have exercises to um, build familiarity and competency. If you don't do good exercises, I'll be honest with you, that you'll be in a situation where all of this is for naught because people don't read plans and get it. They have to do it. And that's the power of an exercise is it takes that and internalizes it. So on that note, I'm going to stop, and Lisa, I'd be happy to take any questions. Regina, thank you so much. I appreciate all of the information that you gave us today. There is a lot to digest. Um, we did get a couple of bookkeeping questions in. Um, so the first question that we did get was about the slides, um, and yes, we will be putting the slides out in an email in a couple of days, so everyone will get a copy of that and of the a video of today's webinar so they can review it at their leisure or share it with their peers. 
And then we also did get a question about templates, and we will be re uh, sharing resources with templates, and then also if anybody is an Everbridge client already, we do have an extensive library of templates in Everbridge University that's free to anyone who is a client of ours. You can go in and um, look them up yourselves and adapt them for your specific facility. In addition to that, because of the new CMS guidelines that are coming out that we all need to meet by November of next year, uh, we are working with Boston University to revise all of our templates to be in line with the CMS guidelines. So people will be able, again for free, to take all of that information and adapt it to their facility. The other thing that I wanted to bring up, Regina, was you had talked about how mobile phones can be uh, a problem during a crisis, that the, the civilian network crashes um, because of overuse, or even in the case of a terrorist threat, like with the Boston Marathon bombing, they, the authorities actually took the network down so that the terrorists couldn't talk to each other. Um, but with a with a system such as Everbridge, we're actually at the same level as FEMA for clearance. So after the White House and after the military, all of our network messaging, texting, and video information has the authority to go through. Mm -hmm. okay. so that's always good to know. So Everbridge, our critical communication platform covers absolutely everything from the safety and security of the staff and patients, uh, the emergency department, IT operations, if your EMR system goes down, there, we have a whole process in place to bring that back in. Uh, one of the things that we really do believe is that good communication is good medicine and that will help everyone stay healthy and happy and be able to respond quickly during an emergency situation. Okay, let me get to our first question. So, do you change who is contacted in an incident depending on the type of hazard, for instance, a chemical spell versus an epidemic? Hmm. That's a really great question. So initially in the emergency response phase, you very likely would have a different contact list based on the scenario. Although I will say to you that, and, and I'm really, uh, so the question is talking about the initial assessment process. I will be honest with you, even from a disease perspective or a, um, a, a fire or some event like that, the thing about that is that you still are going to have some core people that are always going to be present. Uh, you're always going to have facilities people, you're always going to have security people, you're always going to have very likely um, technology present and then you might add in special people so for example if it was a outbreak of Zika in your area or there was a SARS outbreak or something like that you would have infectious disease docs and nurses that would be part of that process so I think my response is this is that you need to have a core team that's practiced that knows their job and comes together on a regular basis and that's a, a, a key group of individuals there will be subject matter experts that are brought in at the time of crisis depending on what the crisis is that will be able to provide that subject matter expertise. But you need a core group of people that clearly know their job, and then you bring in the SMEs as you need to. Great. Thank you very much. Um, and our, our next question, in this day and age of budget cuts, how can you convince leadership of the importance of emergency management so that they support it? Oh boy, that's such a really important issue. Uh, and I, first of all, I, mean, I have a couple ways to sort of go about that. First of all, is that I believe everybody who's in the field of emergency management needs to have some executive sponsor that they are going to be able to go to at this at, uh, at, to support them. And you've got to find somebody on your executive team. So look at the group of group of individuals, uh, depending on what kind of facility you're at. Maybe it's an admitted hospital administrator, maybe it's somebody else. But who on that top level of five, six, ten people, however many there are? that actually can be your sponsor because you need somebody at the top level who's going to say this is important. So that's the first thing. The second thing is I would really encourage you to really think about what I call overt and covert marketing. So what does that mean? Overt marketing for your program means that you actually are uh, overtly selling what you do for a living. It's not the fact that you say to people, boy, when the bad thing happens, this is really going to be great that we have this. No, you want to find ways to talk about how what you're doing on a daily basis helps make your environment safer, uh, more productive, maybe because of the training, people know what to do in many different situations. So you want to figure out what's the overt marketing. And then you also want to promote 
different types of events during the year. So, for example, a different time, uh, different months have different um, um, uh, occasions. So, October is National Fire Month. September is National Preparedness Month. In California, April is Earthquake Month. So, find those kind of opportunities to then go back and give you a chance to sell what you do. The covert marketing of your program is where you actually uh, talk about uh, kind of under the under the radar, so to speak, about the importance of your program. And I'll tell you what I do is that I uh, set up something called Google Alerts. And if you're not familiar with Google Alerts, you can actually Google Google Alerts. And when you go to Google Alerts, you can actually set up any keywords, uh, and it will deliver to you. Mama Google every day will send you an email with all the uh, publications that appeared in the last 24 hours about that topic. So if you're in hospitals and you're concerned about emergency departments, you can say hospital emergency department emergency or, or fire or active shooter or something like that. And every day that's going to be given to you. And what you can do is you can overtly or covertly, excuse me, share that with key decision makers. Did you know this just happened at one at another hospital in, you know, maybe it's in a totally different state, doesn't matter. The idea is you continue to educate people about the importance of this work, how it affects your industry, what you do for a living, uh, and find ways that you can just constantly keep pushing that out there, pushing that out there. Um, there was also a webinar that I did for uh, Everbridge uh, sometime this year on the return on investment for emergency planning uh, that I would encourage you to look through the web um, webinar archives because we speak directly to this issue. Great. I will add that uh, in our email roundup. I'll, I'll make okay. sure that they have a link to that webinar so they can review it. Thank you for mentioning that. Yeah. Um, we did get a quick question. I, I know I just I can answer it quickly from Ryan who asked how um, often you need to drill. And um, because of the new CMS emergency preparedness guidelines, they're in place um, as of about five weeks ago. You now need to drill on an annual basis with an active drill. And then you need to do one additional drill, which is either a tabletop or a secondary active drill. Mm -hmm. um, so this is something that everybody on this call is going to need to address um, between now and November 16th in 2017. That is the deadline. And then our last question for today, do you have a recommendation for an electronic health system situational awareness tool? Oh gosh, that's a great, great question. And the answer I'm going to have to, it will be short because the answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> I will say to you that situational awareness is a very, very challenging area for all different professions. And again, I would really have you do some noodling on that about where your information is likely to come from, how you can pull it together and how you can pull it in, and whether you have administrative individuals who are basically scribing things on whiteboards or whatever it is, but also clearly think about that. And let me just add one more thing about that. If you're in the command center and you're a facilities person, you might have pre-identified status boards that you're already thinking about, about what you want to be reporting on. So maybe it's by floors of a building, maybe it's also by critical areas of the building, maybe it might be other locations that you're responsible for. But if you stop and think about now, what do I need to report on? And if you actually think about that and then scribe that out, and then when you get into your command center, you throw up that information onto a status board, and as you get data about those different things, you can begin to capture that and then display that. Uh, but part of it is, is that each group in a, in a command center needs to clearly think about what do I need to report on? What's my dashboard? How can I tell the executives either the building is green, yellow, red, and what do I need to know for that? So that'd be actually a very interesting kind of whiteboard activity for you to do with your facilities team. Um, so I would like to thank everybody for their attendance today. Regina, thank you very much again for your information and taking the time to answer all of these great questions. If you have any questions uh, specifically for us, you can reach me at lisa.johnson at everbridge.com. I'll be happy to coordinate answers with Regina or answer them as best I can internally. Thank you again, everyone. I hope to see you soon.